We'll go from there. And we'll start with Mr. Blake. Good evening, Frederick Blake, Emily for Mackenzie Delta. <clears throat> Good evening, Michael Nelly, MLA for Detchel. Devin O'Reilly, Frank Mike. Thank you. Uh, on my left is uh, Megan Welsh, our Legislative Assembly Analyst, and on my right is Doug Showery, our Clerk. Um, can I have a, approve the agenda as it presented? Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Any conflict of interest? Seeing none. Uh, Minister, Mr. Moses, <coughs> would you like to introduce your uh, staff and open up the meeting with any? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, good evening, and uh, uh, good evening to the uh, committee members. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss the NWT Education Renewal and Action Plan, which is currently in its third school year of implementation. Tonight with me, I have Ms. Sylvia Hayner, Deputy Minister, on my right. On my left, Ms. Rita Mueller, Assistant Deputy Minister for Education and Culture. Uh, also joining us this evening is Ms. Julia Mott, Senior Advisor to the Deputy Minister, and Ms. Mai Lepage. Minister, my, uh, special Ministerial Advisor. Mr. Chair, the Education Renewal and Innovation Framework Direction for Change was tabled in 2013, lays out a 10-year vision for change that states Northern learners shall receive a quality education in order to live fulfilled lives as capable people and, co and contribute to strong, healthy communities. Change in education around the world today is being driven in part by new research on how the brain works and how people learn. Change is also being driven by new technologies that enhance learning. New tools and easy access to endless amounts of online information is shifting the teacher's role from being a holder of information and expertise to that of critical coach, showing students how to select, work with, and apply information in meaningful ways to meaningful questions. International research and data are pointing to difficulties that many of the world's current education systems are having in preparing students for the demands of today's fast-changing world. People everywhere are concerned with engaging learners in their learning and helping them develop the knowledge and skills needed for the needs of today's workplace or for further education or training. Educational research is also showing that education, which considers the well-being of the whole person, co cognitive, emotional, social, spiritual, and physical, can improve academic success overall. This includes supporting and teaching self-regulation, resilience, and a positive sense of identity. It is clear that to improve student success, students' environments and experiences must be developed in a holistic way. The directions for change targeted through NWT Education Renewal are reflective of the reality that the world of education is changing globally, nationally, and territorially to better meet the needs of students so that students can be knowledgeable and possess the skills needed to participate in the 21st century economy. Mr. Chair, I am happy to report that we are now in the third year of implementing the Education Renewal Action Plan. We have taken a collaborative approach to the development and ongoing implementation process where working groups made up of educators, <clears throat> education leaders, elders, representatives from other departments, NGOs, and Northwest Territories Teachers Association, parents, and business are proving, providing recommendations for direction of each initiative. Early implementation of several initiatives is underway with promising preliminary results. Many of the education renewal initiatives have been initiated through pilot projects in interested schools and communities. Pilot projects represent a measured approach which helps to evaluate and determine whether to adapt, build capacity for, scale up, or stop an initiative. Mr. Chair, with your permission, I ask the, that the Assistant Deputy Minister go through the presentation that offers a detailed update on the NWT Education Renewal Actions. Following the presentation, I will be happy to answer any of the um, members' questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Moses. As it is our custom, we will move on to your assistant deputy minister, Ms. Mueller, to move forward with the presentation. Mm -hmm. And then we'll ask questions at that time. The committee agrees to that process? Agreed? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. If um, I could ask that you turn to slide two of the presentation. Um, as we know, so much has changed in the world uh, of education over the past 30 years, and uh, it would be surprising if our schools remained the same as when we were going to school. The purpose of NWT Education Renewal is to determine how we can improve our NWT education system for all learners so that uh, they can have the skills necessary to meet the challenges of today and tomorrow and to be successful. The data that we collect uh, overall uh, about our NWT student achievement and wellness outcomes have indicated that we have much work to do. The 2011 Aboriginal Student Achievement Education Plan significantly contributed to this discussion and has helped to show the need to do more than simply tweak our existing system. It revealed the need to think differently about the education system as a whole, from early childhood to adult and post-secondary education and training, lifelong learning. National and international research and partner jurisdictions like Alberta also have had a major influence on our own education renewal. There are a number of uh, other items acting as catalysts for the change and for education renewal, and that has led us to move in a new direction and to be willing to try new approaches. These catalysts include a detailed report from the Office of the Auditor General, as well as data and assessments from both internal and external uh, sources. If you could turn to slide three, please. Both academic research and research here at home in the Northwest Territories has helped our department understand that our education system must allow our students to see the connections between their everyday lives, what they're doing in school, and the world at large. <coughs> it also uh, indicates that for students to be truly engaged in school, they need to own their learning. They need to be held responsible for their behavior and take a lead in determining what their future will be. We also know that it's crucial for students to know where they come from, who they are, in order to determine who they will become. And here in the NWT, our schools need to be the heart of our communities where all of our students feel welcome and safe and that they have endless opportunities to develop healthy relationships with teachers, their peers, and the community at large. If I can ask you to turn to slide four. <coughs> Excuse me. It's important to understand that the education renewal framework <coughs> excuse me, is not an, ex an encyclopedia of specific projects that will be undertaken over the next 10 years. What it is is a directional document, not a prescriptive one. Nevertheless, there are major principles that guide the work coming out of this 10-year framework, and th these give a coherence of approach to the different initiatives that you will see uh, have emerged as part of education renewal work. <clears throat> These principles include wellness, the, the first principle, and it's fundamental to improved success in education. This wellness applies to both students and teachers. The second principle is a shift in how we approach teaching and learning. Um, and if we are going to have greater numbers of students succeed in education, what are the shifts that we need to make? And the third is the, the work of change involves all aspects of our education system and that much of the work is interconnected as a genuine uh, way of living. Slide five. The work of education renewal touches on all areas of education in the Northwest Territories but can uh, be captured in eight different areas for action. The remainder of this presentation will provide a summary of the current work being completed in each of these eight areas for action as led by the department, but it's important to note in partnership with key educational stakeholders such as the Northwest Territories Teachers Association, our superintendents of education, numerous NWT teachers and principals, other GNWT departments, and in particular with health and social services. I could ask you to turn to slide six. The first area of action uh, that has been a focus over the past three years is under Aboriginal language and culture. One of our initiatives called the Elders in School Program is in its fourth year of implementation, having successfully been piloted in our schools for three years. Elders in Schools continues to be an important part of connecting schools and communities 
and showing students the importance of striving to be strong like two people. In 2015, engagements began with Aboriginal language experts representing each NWT District Education Council to begin the work of uh, developing an Aboriginal curriculum for K-9. The first draft of our languages curriculum will be completed by the end of this summer and uh, all of our education authorities will be invited to participate for this upcoming school year, 1718, in what we refer to as a small scale pilot of this curriculum. A three day training for selected teachers and principals of the pilot schools will take place in early September and the development of assessment tools and teacher resources manual will be ongoing um, uh, throughout the, the um, school year. And in 2018, a territory-wide pilot will take place across the NWT with the full-scale implementation of our languages in 2019. Uh, also, as part of this, um, under this act area for action, uh, we are just finalizing the revision of the Aboriginal Language and Culture-Based Education Directive. And the plan is that uh, the new directive uh, will begin to be phased into schools in the 2018-19 school year. What this uh, revision will include is a direction for schools to implement language and culture programming, increased financial measures and accountability, as well as the compliance tool and guidelines for the school for the implementation. The engagement meetings for, the engagement meetings for feedback um, and the feedback we've received in this work is from a Wisdom Keepers, a working group that we've established with elders from across the territories as well as other external working group members. And finally, as a part of this work is our cultural orientation days programming for all education staff. And it's really meant to support our education staff in understanding the unique culture, history, traditions and values of the NWT community that they're living and serving in as well as uh, as a whole NWT. If I could ask you to move to slide seven. Slide seven. Area of action is the inclusive schooling um, directive that we have. Uh, as you're all aware, uh, the revised directive uh, began implementation during this current 2016-17 school year. Uh, the new funding structure and the new model of this revised uh, inclusive schooling um, uh, directive uh, is meant to take place over the next three years. Through this renewed directive, ECE uh, does expect to see the following things happen within our schools. There will be an increased number of program support teachers in our schools because they have an explicit role and expertise to help coach, guide and support classroom teachers in better meeting the diverse needs of their students. Uh, we uh, expect and main, uh, that we will maintain the amount of funding for classroom support existence as they are um, currently um, employed. And we also uh, have begun this is to increase the inclusive schooling education training and in-servicing for school-based uh, staff and also including our education authority staff. We expect to see that every school will develop a functioning school-based support team um, that really ensures that they have an organized and coordinated approach to meeting the needs of students, especially those with complex needs. And lastly, uh, this directive has established the monitoring and evaluation um, of how, um, when this directive is being implemented and uh, has strengthened the accountability for the use of the funds to ensure maximum positive impact on students. Education bodies will be using the new inclusive school compliance tool for the first time uh, this school year and uh, that's being done right now in May and June. This reporting tool will enable our department to monitor each of the region's compliance with every aspect of the inclusive schooling directive and then um, help us as a department offer the needed supports to move uh, forward in each of the regions depending on where they're at. The renewing of the inclusive schooling funding framework has resulted in much more prescriptive funding approach where funds are required to be spent within certain categories of spending. And this is particularly true of inclusive schooling staffing which represents a large majority of the spending. Uh, 
The new compliance in the new compliance tool uh, for this uh, funding framework is being phased in so that education bodies have three years, three school years, to come to full compliance uh, with the new funding structure um, as outlined uh, earlier. Uh, one of the things that uh, the department has uh, postponed uh, for the upcoming school year that we had hoped uh, would be established is the territorial support team. And DCE had planned on establishing a territorial support team comprised of various experts in order to strengthen and implement the inclusive schooling directive. This team would include a combination of speech and language pathologists, behavior specialists, occupational therapists, and trauma-informed specialists, as well as educational psychologists. And the purpose of the team was to increase capacity of our schools by developing and delivering training and training resources and to provide expert advice uh, for those school teams in the support of students with complex needs in developing their plans. If you could turn to uh, slide eight. The third area of action is self-regulation, healthy foods for learning and wellness data. Self-regulation relates to a person's ability to monitor their own level of energy and alertness in order to stay at an optimal state of calm and focus. Every one of our education authorities wanted to be part of this initiative. Many NWT educators have already taken related courses, uh, training and learning opportunities in the past two years um, in this area. And uh, the other thing that I, I wanted to share is that student wellness data is collected in a variety of ways, um, how we're collecting that uh, in partnership with our schools. The first is the Early Development Instru Instrument, or EDI, as you're familiar with, for four- and five-year-old children. Um, the second uh, um, instrument we use is called the Middle Years Development in Instrument, and this is uh, targeted for students in grades four and seven annually. And then we also participate in a Canadian-wide uh, survey called the, Health Beha the Healthy Behaviors of School-Aged Children. That happens every four years. And it has a survey um, specific for kids in grades 6 to 8 and a different one for kids in grade 9 to 10. If I could ask that you turn to slide 9. This area of action um, focuses on safe and caring schools. Of course, the safety and security of our students and uh, our school staff is of utmost importance to the minister and the department. A national expert was contracted to help the department review all of the NWT uh, school safe, safe school plans, uh, which are now being revised and strengthened based on his feedback. The department is also currently developing a territorial model of school emergency response planning that will be in place in this upcoming school year. <coughs> and in addition to creating a safe and caring school space for all, We've been focusing on creating a territorial policy relevant to LGBTQ issues in schools in collaboration with the relevant NGOs and our education authorities. Um, and for the first time ever uh, this past March, uh, NWT Youth Rainbow Conference took place bringing youth together from all over the Northwest Territories to help uh, shape and guide this work. If I can ask you to turn to slide 10. This area of action, broadly called Supporting Northern Professionals, has a number of different initiatives under it. And really, um, this whole commitment is to ensure that our NWT educators have access to the experiences and resources that they need to enhance their wellness in order for them to focus on excellence in teaching. Some of these programs uh, or initiatives under Supporting Northern Professionals include the following. We have a program called Education Leadership Program, or ELP. Um, it's built in our Education Act, and what it is is it requires all of our NWT principals to complete a prescribed program for certification. Um, and how it's held is over two 10-day uh, uh, summer experiences. Um, that is part of the work that we have been uh, renewing as well to ensure that um, um, all of the aspects and focus of that ELP align with our um, education renewal and our revision of new directives. Another program that we're very proud of is our teacher induction and mentorship program. 
We're currently renewing this program in this school year with the help of all of our education authorities and the, the Teachers Association with the intent that the induction and mentorship of new teachers be delivered as two separate programs. This will help pr provide clarity of the roles and accountability uh, for the program and we're hoping that uh, through this revised induction and mentorship program that we will build teacher confidence, especially those that are new and beginning in teaching, so that they'll want to continue um, staying here and we can keep them in the Northwest Territories. Another initiative that we're very proud of that will have its third uh, year this upcoming August here in Yellowknife is the New to the North um, Educators Conference. And uh, what this does is it brings together all of the new hires from all of the education authorities um, together in August prior to, ideally prior to them going into their home community. And the idea of that three-day uh, uh, conference and training is to help them uh, really be grounded in where they are, who they're serving, and really the foundation of what's expected of them as teachers. It's been very well received and uh, we're, we're going to continue that in August. And the last uh, uh, big initiative is one that we've just dealt with and that's the strengthening teacher instructional practice. And so I will move on from that. Oh, sorry, and one other part that I want to mention to you is this October we are going to be having uh, principal training and in-servicing in October for one week. And the idea here is that we're really going to work with principals and assistant principals in helping them uh, be better informed and trained on issues like mental health um, as well as trauma-informed uh, practices and as well as um, strengthening their inclusive schooling. Um, experience and awareness of how they can support their teachers. Slide 11, action, uh, area for action six, uh, really concentrates on what we refer to as high school pathways and graduation requirements. So for the past two years, we've been working with an extensive working group that's comprised of a multitude of education staff, Aurora College staff, the NWT skills and kind of post-secondary staff, as well as business and industry representatives. And what we're really looking at is, do we need to make changes to our current grades 10 to 12 program to better meet the needs of, of our high school students um, and still recognize their learning? So that's really where we're at right now. And the how is, will there be different pathways for grades 10 to 12 students leading them uh, more specifically, for example, to trades, if that's what they're interested in, to college or university, to on-the-job training after uh, senior secondary, and so on. So in the heart of that work, of course, the major consideration for us is the changes that Alberta is making as well, too. And because we're part of that process of that K-12 to uh, change, we feel that that will align very nicely. And then, if I could turn your attention to slide 12, this is, oh sorry, this is also continued, the area of action six. This is specific to a, an initiative that we are seeing really promising results. We call this the Northern Distance Learning Initiative or e-learning. And uh, currently we have six small communities that are participating uh, with Anuvik in this uh, e-learning um, initiative. As a department, we've outlined uh, the goal of having two more small schools join every school year to try to increase the number of small schools accessing this opportunity for their students. And uh, we're pleased to let you know that we do have uh, two more schools, small community schools coming on in the upcoming school year. And the essence of this is opening up the breadth of academic courses in math, science, language arts, um, what am I missing? Social studies, sorry. Uh, core subjects for our smallest community school students so that they are able to take those higher level, what we call Dash 1 courses, as supported by teachers and students in Anuvik. And then if I could uh, draw your attention to slide 13, uh, which really in this area of action, it deals with the curriculum aspect of key competencies are JK to grade 12 curriculum and student assessment. There's a number of initiatives um, under this area of action. And um, uh, as outlined on the, on the, um, on the uh, slide, 
Uh, for a long time, it was believed that learners acquired understanding by dividing up our subject areas into separate subjects and specific content. And uh, what brain research is um, letting the field of education know is that there's unlimited access to information and that it's fundamental that instead of separating these different subject areas, that it's m uh, much better for our learners, for our students, if when we look at curriculum, it's based on the connections between these subject areas because that's much more of how we live in our day-to-day -day life. The other change that's happening in Alberta, certainly in the Northwest Territories and really across Canada, is the movement of curriculum as it's being revised to be based on competencies. The best way that uh, we could describe that is in the Northwest Territories, we've been working on what we call the NWT key competencies of what a capable person is. And that is really helping us shape the first um, uh, a really big undertaking of curriculum, which is JK to grade nine health and wellness curriculum that we've been working on. Uh, this year we've had a small, what we call small school piloting of the grades four to six uh, draft curriculum in this area. And uh, the idea is that this upcoming fall 2017-18, all of our grade four to six uh, teachers will be delivering this and providing feedback so that um, we can finalize that portion of the curriculum. Then we're going to move to JK to grade three, and then we are going to um, finish the grade um, seven to um, nine part. Another really uh, big initiative uh, that many of the education authorities uh, have already started implementing and are very interested in um, is the idea of whole region rights. And so the idea of that is that teachers work together within schools and within regions to develop common standards and tools to help support student writing. Um, and so this is a, an initiative that we're working on to support right across all of our education authorities. We also have initiatives to strengthen the, the awareness and training and skills of teachers to uh, better deliver literacy. Uh, programs as well as numeracy programs. And we also uh, are very proud to be a full partner in Alberta's comprehensive renewal of their K-12 curriculum. That work began formally in October 2016. It will continue over the next several years. And uh, we now are at a stage where uh, there's representation from each of our education authorities in that work as well. And then the last, uh, the last slide of this presentation uh, slide 14 is the area of action uh, referred to as accountability. And this is really uh, the department's work uh, in working with our superintendents of education in order to develop and strengthen a JK to grade 12 accountability framework. Uh, this will be implemented for the first time this upcoming 2017-18 school year. And uh, we're looking forward to the, the the learning that happens in going through this pr pro process for the first time and then making any changes based on that experience of the education authorities um, in, in doing that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Mueller. Thank you very much for your well-informed presentation. Um, any questions from the minister or Ms. Mueller on uh, what we've heard? I know it's been a long day. Mr. Blake. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just going through the orientation, I know firsthand like a good example is in Fort McPherson when they have new teachers coming on. I know they do on the land programs with them. Uh, very successful. A lot of the community members come out. Elders, you know, are very successful. They most likely travel to um, either Midway Lake or, you know, some some other place out on the land and it's very positive and you know a good example today one of the teachers got an award for excellence and you know it's very clear that these are actually working in the communities and I'm hoping that uh, it continues and you know, I just wanted to make that observation thank you thank you Mr. Blake any other questions or comments from the minister 
I've got about 30 of them, but I'll try to minimize them here. Um, on slide seven, you talk about inclusive schooling. And <clears throat> I'm starting to see more and more cases of people that have been diagnosed or um, through autism. It, it's been having a in, huge impact. Um, and I know down south, they have a one-on-one -on -one approach to it, and we're trying to, we try to do a team approach to it. Um, have you guys looked at this one-on-one -on -one and seen how it has an impact on the students compared to your process? Thank you. I don't know if it's Minister Moses. Maybe I'll, <coughs> maybe I'll just make a little comment before I, I go to Rita and she can fill in the, on some of the details. Um, I also sit on the uh, National uh, uh, Council for Ministers of Education, and uh, this was an agenda item, and it's something that's uh, right across the country in terms of inclusive schooling and the challenges that all uh, school boards and authorities are having. And uh, we, we, we don't, we're no different up here in the Northwest Territories, but uh, it is something that will continue to be on the agenda at the national level, and how do we address it and find the resources fiscally or human resources to address some of these issues. Um, I know uh, uh, my assistant deputy minister has been working in some of those areas and trying to, trying to address the challenges that we're seeing at the, the, the regional level throughout the NWT. And uh, maybe I can just fill it, get her to uh, give you a little bit more an update and, and the work that's going on with our working groups as well to try to address some of these challenges. Thank you, Minister Moses. Mr. Mueller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Minister. Uh, as the Minister was saying, um, and as you were saying, Mr. Chair, it's not, it's not just unique to the NWT, but more and more our, our school system is seeing children with very complex needs coming in. So as a result of that, uh, your question about one-on-one, -on -one, uh, just to clarify, absolutely, there are children that need one-on-one -on -one and will also always need one-on-one. -on -one. There, there are those cases of children. But what we found through our research in working with other jurisdictions of uh, trying to um, learn as much as we can about what's working or not working um, in inclusive schooling is that one thing that we do know is the key to helping um, more of the children be successful is helping the teachers gain the, the broader skills they need in working with kids with different um, either challenges, uh, difficulties, you know, areas that they, they really need support in. And the fact is what we hear from all of our partners, as the minister has alluded to uh, nationally, is that there just seems like there'll never be enough resources uh, to, to uh, in, in the ideal world of having, uh, you know, as many one-on-one -on -one perhaps than a school would like. So instead, our focus has been on how can we, um, over the next few years, make a concentrated effort on helping our teachers become better instructional uh, teachers and being able to better support students with diverse needs. And one of those ways um, is through having dedicated program support teachers in our schools whose role is to mentor, coach, guide, co-teach, and, and help our teachers, our everyday classroom teachers, get better at meeting those needs of children. And so yes, there will always be a need for one-on-one, -on -one, but uh, really the resources uh, to have the number of one-on-one -on -one that schools will say that they need, it, it would be an endless, uh, endless supply of resources that don't exist. So instead, we're going to try to help our teachers become better at helping kids. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Um, that's great to hear. I guess my biggest struggle, as I know in my experience in just the last, well, probably the last 10 years, this year there's one classroom that has five uh, students that have the spectrum from here to here, and one teacher has to deal with this and, and you know, has to support and you're given the educating them. But I think we're, we, you know, we just finished talking about uh, in structural hours and t teachers wellness and that but if we have these this is an issue is there a way for communities that have these bigger challenges I guess is the best way to say it um, is there a way for we that the department is able to work with them besides teaching training the teachers and thank you Minister Moses 
And I as uh, we went through the presentation, uh, you know, this is one of the initiatives that we're taking on and trying to create some of those uh, support teams within the uh, the school system. So, uh, not one teacher is is uh, doing a lot of the work and and uh, working with the the, the ch possibly a child or or children, and that uh, as a support team, we can have a more of a uh, integrated uh, study. We're also working with the uh, Department of Health and Social Service to see how we address this as well. As I said, it is a challenge and. And uh, with that, uh, what we said like downstairs with the 155 million that we give to the schools, I mean, it's a challenge there too with the education authorities, how they, they budget their dollars. And I think as we have this accountability framework that you see on the end of the, at the end of the slide, that's going to show us how, where dollars are going and the monitoring the evaluation of inclusive schooling to see if there are shortfalls. And uh, if there are shortfalls, then we'd have to come back and, uh, uh, through the bed budgetary process to see how we can try to get increased funding to uh, meet those needs. Thank you, Minister Moses. Mr. Natalie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, um, yeah, appreciate the update in terms of the major initiatives that the department has undertaken. I just wanted to uh, reference you to uh, uh, earlier today, I made reference to it too. It's on page nine on, on top of this report, uh, this K-12 schooling, and I quote, Student support program data for 2010-11 shows that over 25% of the NWT students are not at the academic level. They should be for their age. In smaller communities, in smaller communities, the number of students below grade level is close, closer to 50%. NWT data indicate a decrease in student achievement as students get older, further demonstrating an urgent need for changes to our current educational system including earlier interventions and support. So um, I just wanted to, to maybe understand if, you know, there's maybe uh, an immediate uh, initiative that has been undertaken. Um, it seems rather urgent to try to at least work with our students from smaller communities to be on par, not only with Alberta standards. Uh, I noticed that it's comparable to Alberta, but at a national level, um, at what point can we see some immediate results in terms of the investments in teaching and teachers and um, educational resources that we, you know, we, we, we invest by way of schools and teachers in smaller communities? Thank you, Mr. Natalie. Mr. Mo Mr. Moses. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I think that's where uh, the discussion on the education renewal is uh, comes into comes into play. We're doing a lot of different things that we're hoping to adjust some of the uh, the low outcomes that we're seeing in some of the small communities. Uh, investments in early childhood uh, uh, program funding, uh, junior kindergarten, and some of the communities that don't have daycare, so that uh, when children enter the uh, our school system, that they're developmentally ready. Uh, Self-regulation that we're we've pu pushing into the schools, which we've seen some really good. Uh, uh, some really good examples as we've been traveling to the communities and uh, continue to uh, train our staff in some of these areas so that they can be uh, um, as, uh, can be there for the children. They're the ones that see the uh, children most of the day. So we are doing a lot of investments. Uh, immediate results, uh, it's going to be, uh, be a while before we start seeing some, some good results. But some of the uh, programs that we are doing, some like great impact results that uh, it might take a while, but some of the stuff that we're doing now, right now, we're, we are seeing the results and we'll continue to monitor and evaluate these uh, pilots that we're doing and uh, continue to share that with committee, but also continue to support those programs going forward. Thank you, Minister Moses. Mr. Nadley. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm familiar with uh, a couple of years back where parents took the extraordinary step of sending their kids down to a Sylvan Learning Center because their, their, their kids are, were, were behind in grades and, and so as an effort to try to make them on par with their classmates, they invested the, you know, out of their own initiative to, to bring their, their kids down to, um, to a, a center and I think it was in Alberta. Um, you know, we have to try to work within the system, work within legislation, work with teachers, work with the, 
schools, but you know we have in the summertime. Once like this June, um, summer is over and done with. Um, you know we have teachers go back to their respective homes, and so for a period of two or three months, there's no teachers in our communities. And um, I, I wonder if maybe the, the the minister could comment on, you know, maybe exploring the idea of uh, you know having to assist our students that need remediation, that need catch up, need to maybe be challenged maybe in a science program that they're excelling in and trying to develop their potential, whether it's beyond the scope of um, what's currently been proposed to examine the idea of summer school. Um, you know, maybe that's maybe that's not out of the question. Would would the minister consider such a concept? Thank you, Mr. Natalie. Minister Moses. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And right now, we, we do have flexibility in how uh, school plans and school scheduled uh, calendars are laid out. I know in Fort Providence, they do some very unique things. Uh, I think, I believe, Saks Harbor is looking at uh, how they reflect their, their school calendar to uh, address some, some of those areas. Uh, those are discussions that we'd have with, to have with the education authorities uh, working, moving forward. But uh, the concept itself, I think, um, we'd also have to look at the, uh, the collective agreement with our teachers because uh, they do need some time off as, as well in the summertime and whether or not uh, uh, that would be something that we can, can address. Thank you, Minister Moses. Any other questions for the Minister? Mr. Blake. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just under Aboriginal language and culture, um, you know, spoke very briefly about it but um, you know from what I understand there may be some added funding to this part here and uh, you know it'd be I think it'd be real beneficial like um, you know as we have students that are graduating um, I'm hoping that we have some that are interested in you know going to school in Fairbanks that have a very successful program. I, I know the ADM is familiar with it because we visited the site a few years back. But uh, you know, real promising the program that they have there, and you know, within the first year, the students are actually speaking in Gwich'in and other languages. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm really hoping because Gwich'in is one of the ones that are really um, in danger right now. That, you know, we we need to get more students that are. Um, taking up Gwich'in and Inuvialuit, Inuvialuit, and um, so I, I'm really hoping that we could uh, hopefully come out with scholarships or something to work with the Gwich'in Tribal Council and Inuvialuit Regional Council in the near future here to see if there's interest in uh, students going to school in Fairbanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister Moses. Or? Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> As you know, we did table the Aboriginal languages uh, framework just recently. We do have a secretariat, and we can bring those suggestions forward to the secretariat and and uh, just throw around some ideas. But I think it's, uh, as you mentioned, we've seen success, some success there, and and in the previous government, to go to the Fairbanks and see how that program is run. I think it's uh, a good possibility. Thank you, Minister Moses, Mr. Blake, and then follow up. Um, no, that, that's good right now. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Mr. Blake. Uh, any other questions for Minister Moses? Okay, I'll ask my next set of questions. Um, and I'll try to get us out of here in probably 10 minutes because I'll probably handpick the questions I have. Yeah, in regards to slide nine, we talk about you talk about a healthy relationship, anti-bullying program in in place in NWT schools in all region. I guess I'm I'm trying to understand this program because I'm still hearing about bullying happening in the schools, and it's uh, how is this program being successful, and how can we make it better to get make sure it's improved for uh, all, all our schools? Thank you, Minister. Moses. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And we do have a, a territorial school code of conduct, as well as uh, all our schools have done uh, uh, safe school plans to, to address this. A lot of it is uh, 
self-monitoring to, to make sure that they're, they're doing it, uh, following what the, uh, uh, but what the regulations as well as the school code of conduct are uh, within their, their institutions. But uh, I know that Rita has been doing some work on this with the, uh, the working group, so I'll ask her to just give us a little bit more of an update. Thank you, Minister Moses. Ms. Mueller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Minister. Uh, so um, just to reiterate, every one of our schools has some sort of healthy relationship program that they're offering to their students. Um, in some cases, in the bigger schools, they might have two or three, depending on the age group. Uh, so again, the idea there is to really help teach and model and practice what it means to, uh, to be in a healthy relationship and to deal with conflict, stress, anger in a, a much more healthy way. So that is going on in all of our schools. We made that a requirement, actually. The other thing that um, we're doing is we're really trying to uh, learn from other jurisdictions, uh, Mr. Chair, because in other jurisdictions, uh, they, they are into this kind of work uh, for a number of years ahead of us. And as a result of that, we're working with Ray Hughes, uh, from Ontario, who is uh, kind of a guru in this area across Canada, helps most of the provinces and territories in this work. And um, in learning from his advice is you have to have a com combination of things happening over time to decrease it in the school. That is the healthy relationship programs being taught at different levels, uh, you know, all grades in a school, that you really have to have this code of conduct that sets out the expectations for everyone within the school environment, which we've established, and then really um, engaging students in the most meaningful way uh, to really um, understand what they can do uh, to help uh, mitigate where they see uh, bullying taking place. Because unfortunately, even if the school over time becomes more and more of a safe and caring environment, which we want for and expect for all of our uh, schools, Bullying is a societal issue, and uh, bullying is not just uh, happening in the school. It's, uh, it can be happening, of course, in the evenings and the weekends and on the playgrounds, on, in sporting events and all kinds of uh, areas. And so we're just hoping that uh, with having all of these pieces in place and, uh, again, um, learning from what other jurisdictions have found to be uh, successful over time is that we believe we're, we're doing that, and we should see over time a decrease in, uh, in incidents related to bullying or violence within a school. Thank you, Ms. Mueller. Um, I guess my question in regards to this acting bullying, we're doing it in a school, but how are we educating the parents in the community about what's being done? Because I, I, I'm, I guess I'm struggling with I've been getting phone calls. I got a bullying situation. I got a bullying situation. You know, it's in the school. And so how are we getting the message, this positive message that you guys are doing in the school out to the parents and the community? Thank you, Ms. Minister Moses. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And, and, you know, this goes all back to we got to empower uh, both our students and our staff to be able to speak up about bullying, report bullying when they see it. Uh, but there, but there is a process. So if you're getting phone calls, as you mentioned in the uh, in your in your writing, uh, I'd encourage you to first of all speak to the principal, uh, let let it be known to them, and then uh, next step is go to the uh, the superintendent. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Moses. I, I I appreciate that advice, but I'm trying to figure out how can we get this promote this positive message that you guys are doing in the school to parents and in the community. So how can we do this? Uh, like, is there an opportunity to work with the schools or, or direct the schools or work with the DECs to get this message out there to the community? So again, it's the process. I mean, to me, it's just the education. How can we work on this to get this information we're, we're hearing in the schools out to the communities and parents? That's my biggest struggle is that Sometimes it's just something that could be tweaked and something that the puzzle work you guys are doing just to make sure we can get that out to the, to the parents and, and the community so they can role model and do everything that you're talking about and so we become a better society, I guess. So 
Thank you. Minister Moses? No, I think that comes back to, uh, well, obviously communication and uh, we, we've been working with our education authorities, but we can put an emphasis with our education authorities. I mean, uh, you bring it up for your writing that uh, it needs to be addressed and there's got to be, uh, help. God, there has to be a, a campaign, a marketing campaign that the education authorities can, can go out and speak to the parents. And in a lot of our small communities, small regions, there's a really good chance that our superintendents or our staff really do know the families that are being affected and should be taking more of a, a leadership role in that area as well with the support from, from our department. Okay. Thank you, Minister Wilson. Is there any way I can get a package that I can work with when I go into my communities yes. and work with them and say, this is what's going on in the school, this is what we're trying to do, so maybe I can address some of these issues that parents have. I go, well, this is what's going on, and this is what we're trying to do. So, I mean, I want to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And so if there's any way there's something that we can get to, you know, the members here and people can move forward with them. So thank you, yep. Minister Moses. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, what we can do is we can get packages uh, done up for all members of the uh, Legislative Assembly. Perfect. Thank you, Minister Moses. Uh, sorry. Is there any other questions for Minister Moses? Or? No? Okay. I will ask a couple more, and then I, I have, yeah, there's probably about six more, but I won't ask a couple more here um, to be respectful. And if I have other further questions, I will Amen. propose to them to Ms. Minister Moses. So when we, uh, it's on slide 10, we talk about the educational uh, leadership program. And uh, maybe Ms. Heard, but it's two 10-day two two uh, sessions. So the first question I have in regards to this, because I'm from very vaguely familiar with it. So do the, the, the teachers um, that are taking this training, do they need to take both sessions or are this two separate sessions? Thank you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Mueller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So yes, they have to take both 10-day both, uh, sessions, one 10-day, one summer, and then the following summer. So. Yeah. All right, thank you. So in regards to this, so there's it's a two, 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 two 10 day sessions. So it's one 10 day session each year. It's not, you don't have two of those 10 day sessions happening throughout that summer. Thank you, Ms. Mueller. Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, so um, it, each summer, for two summers in a row, they have 10 days of courses that they have to do, coursework. Okay, thank you. So I guess my next follow up on this, oh, Ms. Hainer. I think what you were asking is whether or not we have two cohorts each summer. Right. So one taking the first year's 10 days and one taking the second year's 10 days. I think that's what he's asking. What well, yeah, it's similar. Yes, that was actually where I'm coming back to the next yeah. question. So, <laughs> Ms. Mueller? So, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, uh, no, um, we call it phase one and phase two. So, um, in the first summer, they would take phase one for 10 days and then the second summer phase two. Though to complicate this even further, Mr. Chair, they don't have to take phase one before they take phase two. <laughs> they could take phase two one summer and then phase one the next summer. That answers my last question Excellent. on this. That's good to hear. I guess well, I shouldn't say I lie. Here, one more question. How, what's the intake on doing this leadership? And how many are from the Northwest Territories, if you're able to provide that information? long-term northerners. Thank you. Ms. Mueller? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So they're, they're almost um, all from the Northwest Territories because it's a requirement built um, for our NWT principles. It's right in the Education Act. Principals don't have a choice. They have to take it. And so, uh, but what's exciting is we don't just have the principals that have to take it. We have a lot of other northerners every year that are aspiring educational leaders, might be assistant superintendents, or just really uh, interested teachers that can take it. So they apply, and uh, I don't think that we've ever said no to somebody who's applying for something like this because of the opportunity it gives them to really understand our education system much better. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mueller. Mr. Blake. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just under page 11, uh, 
says here you're going to develop a Northern Studies 20 and 30 courses focus on Aboriginal land claims, self-government, stewardship of the land, leadership for the future. I'd just like to know uh, when do you expect this to roll out? Uh, you know, it's much needed, uh, you know, a lot of our lands. We have some outstanding land claims, but uh, a lot of self-government that are getting in place now, and uh, it's really important to have this in the schools. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blick. Minister Moses. Yeah, I know, uh, like everything else, we do have advisory groups working on this uh, uh, important piece of legislation. You want to see it have the same success as we did with uh, Northern Studies 10 and the res residential school uh, curriculum. And, and as such, I know Rita's uh, been working with the working group, so maybe I can get her to give a little bit more of the, uh, the detail. Thank you, Minister Moses. Ms. Mueller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister. So, yes, uh, work is well underway, actually, on the Northern Studies 20. And uh, work has begun on Northern Studies 30. Now, the really exciting part about uh, Northern Studies 20 is that uh, it's an opportunity for our department to work with all of the um, Aboriginal governments because a good component of that, there might be, um, if it's a five-credit course, uh, one or two of the, the um, modules will be kind of generic, you know, for, for all the students to take a broader understanding of across the territories, uh, self-government agreements and so on. But the idea is then uh, for um, at least half the course, they would focus in on their particular uh, you know, self-government agreement and and uh, just have a much better understanding of that. So that's the idea and it's uh, well underway and we have a huge working group, <laughs> advisory group like we did for Northern Studies 10. And Northern Studies 30, uh, we have begun uh, talking to our Alberta counterparts because what we would hope is that they would recognize Northern Studies 30 when it's completed as the equivalent of Social Studies 30. And so that's our, that's our ultimate goal. And um, Alberta is very, very open to that. And when Minister uh, Moses met with uh, Minister um, Egan uh, this past fall, um, he was able to share that um, idea with Minister Egan. And uh, Mr. Egan really loved his idea. So uh, we're working towards that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moses. That answers one of the questions I already had down there, so that's good. Is there any other questions from Minister Moses or the staff? If not, I'd like to thank you very much for attending and for some of the staff that have been part of the bill and the hearings downstairs. I thank you for the long day, I understand, but uh, thank you for your commitment. And if you have any closing comments, Minister Moses. Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Chair. We're just glad that we're able to uh, come before the committee and give a little update on the education uh, renewal framework that we've been working on for the last three years and uh, continue to do the good work. And as we're seeing some results, we want to continue to provide supports uh, moving forward. But obviously, uh, it is in the best interest of our students that we start seeing some good outcomes and, and successes. And any feedback or input that committee can uh, provide would be also greatly appreciated. I know it has been a long day and appreciate all the work that committee has done uh, over the last little while. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Moses. Thank you, Ms. Mueller, Ms. Hainer. Who am I missing here? Ms. Mott and Ms. LePage. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the evening. And your, you, you, the meeting is adjourned. That's the word I'm looking for.